afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Unlocking California Politics. I'm Sanjay Wagley, Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs with the California Association of Realtors. Today I have with us Jordan Levine, Senior Vice President and Chief Economist for the California Association of Realtors. And today he's going to talk about California's housing market. He is responsible for doing economic research for the association, as well as policy an analysis. Um, he has a passion for home ownership and is actively involved in our association's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And he regularly represents the California Association of Re Realtors in its research and economics conversations with the media, public affairs, and various public policy organizations. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you so much for having me. Good to see you. Good to see you. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Housing is always, it seems, top of the mind for many Californians. And this year, especially, we've had a rapid rise in interest rates. Supply problems persist. Um, I, CAR has just released its 2024 forecast, yep. uh, which is actually predicting a better year for buyers and sellers. Is that right? Yeah, for 2024. This year, I'll probably be the low water mark. And it's been a a pretty tough year for transactions and housing affordability. It's funny. It seems like all of our longstanding problems that you mentioned just got that much worse with the pandemic and the aftermath. So it's been a tough year for for sales in particular and for our members for home ownership. And uh, you know, prices keep going up. So it hasn't been too great for affordability, especially with those rates. Okay. So you've pointed out a lot of the issues that we've had with um 2023. Um I guess what would be the the biggest issue being interest rates? Um, would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think interest rates have have been the biggest issue, although not necessarily for the obvious reason. I think when we think of rates, we think of how much people can afford or how much they can qualify for to be able to get a payment that they can afford. And so you, you always think about it through that lens of kind of purchasing power. But I think the bigger impact of, of the rate environment has actually been to supply and we always talk about how we don't build enough and the turnover has been down and people have been staying in their homes longer than ever well now that's even worse again because you have all these folks that back in 2020 2021 went out and and either bought a new home when rates were at three percent or they refied their existing home at three percent and and now nobody wants to sell and that's one of the reasons why even though sales are down so much those prices are going up because, you know, on the one hand, there's a, an impact to buyer demand and you have some people that don't qualify for as much home as they used to. Some people that are kind of were on the bubble maybe before and now they don't qualify at all. And so demand has shrunk a lot, but but the impacts to supply with people locked in at these very, very low rates has been even bigger than the impact to demand. And so again, the affordability situation is actually getting worse, even though I know a lot of people were forecasting prices to plummet and foreclosures and all of that stuff. But it seems quite the opposite. There's actually less on the market now than there was even when we were in like a total shutdown a few years ago. So um, I mentioned that the forecast shows that 2024 will be better. What what makes what will help improve the situation? Yeah, mostly because of supply. On the one hand, I think we're probably going to have to get used to supply being a lot tighter than it used to be historically. And what we used to think of as normal was like six months of supply, even in the kind of post financial crisis, it was still like three to four months. And I think that'll probably be good years for California with so many people locked in. But at the same time, not everybody's at 3%. There's about a third of the market of homeowners at least those of them with with a mortgage that have somewhere north of four percent, they might have a five, a six, and so for those folks, I think rates don't have to come down as much to kind of unlock some of that inventory. And and the other kind of point I would make: so, a, I think there will be more homes available for sale. Not a ton more. It's not going to be a quote unquote normal year, but you'll see some folks get unlocked as we go from over eight percent where we were about a month ago down you know into the sixes and maybe best case low sixes by the end of the year that will at least help to get some folks selling uh, again and i think that that's ultimately the limiting factor right now is just that lack of inventory the other thing though i i think i would kind of caution folks against over celebrating our relatively positive forecast is that we're growing from a really low base so even though we have a 20 percent plus mm -hmm. increase for next year 
And that certainly is welcome news. There's no doubt about it. It's like, you know, if you have a, a really small number and you add another small number to it, that's a huge percent, right? But it's not, we're still at 320,000 and change, not the kind of 500,000s that we were at back when rates were super low. And you mentioned you do see interest rates going down somewhat, yeah. not not that, I guess, you know, not a huge decline, obviously, um, because that would probably be, if that was happening, that would be probably really bad economic news overall if that was happening. Um, yeah. But what, what are the reasons behind interest rates, you know, stabilizing, going down a bit? Yeah, I think rates will go down a little bit. I think the the inflation numbers are are the big driver, and that's the thing the Fed's certainly been really laser focused on is getting inflation under control. They want inflation at two percent. If you go back to last summer, we were running nine percent, roughly almost ten percent. That's come down significantly. We're down at three point two percent already in the most recent data. Um, I think, you know, they've held rates steady already a couple of times. And when you look at their projection for Fed funds rate, I think we'll see it improve as the inflation numbers continue to come down. The other reason why I think we'll do a little better on the Fed funds rate is that I don't I don't believe that the economy is as strong as what a lot of these headline numbers would have us believe. One of the big things driving inflation right now is there's this labor shortage out there and we have a bunch of open positions that we're having a hard time filling and so right. that's caused wages to go up and you know employers don't take that on the chin they pass that along to consumers and so um you know i i think that will be ongoing but i i think that the jobs numbers are a lot you know coming off a lot stronger than what the actual numbers are going to be and every year they go back and benchmark the data and make it line up with how much money got paid into unemployment insurance and all of that and i think when they complete that process in the first quarter, we'll look back and, and see that 2023 wasn't quite as strong economically. And although that's kind of not great news, right? We It actually, through the lens of interest rates, I think it'll help the Fed take their foot off the gas if the economy isn't growing quite as strong. Our forecast still predicts an increase in the state's median home price. It looks like a prediction of 6.2%, uh, which would take it to <laughs> Still, in my mind, a kind of mind-boggling eight hundred and sixty thousand three hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, first of all, why are we still seeing those levels of increase? Given that there will probably be more inventory next year, um, so let's let's start with that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it all comes down to the fundamentals and there's just still, you know, too much demand relative to the supply. And and even at 7% rates, we're still at, you know, roughly you know, low single digits, at least in terms of unemployment. Wages are still going up. The stock market's not doing too bad either. So, so you've still got a lot of folks making money that qualify for mortgages. And again, that supply has really dried up incredibly. And so even though there's a lot less buyers out there, there's a lot, lot less supply and, and they're still kind of keeping upward pressure on those prices. And again, I think, you know, through a, a backdrop of an economy that's still punching above its weight, really, and outperforming a lot of the expectations up to this point. It's really just, a, again, a supply driven show next year we have a little bit more supply but don't forget as rates come down and unlocks those listings it's also going to bring more buyers back in who now qualify or qualify for more and so it it really kind of is is reflective of those long-term structural deficiencies in new construction where it's just we simply have too many bodies and not enough roofs period um that that pretty much mean outside of major economic challenges the price is usually only ever go one one way to the cost of like home ownership and affordability, unfortunately. One of the problems we've seen is whenever we do enter any kind of slowdown or downturn, builders seem to sort of cut building of new houses very significantly. Um, yeah. Do you think you'll start to see if the market somewhat improves that that'll start going back online or, or what do you think will happen? Yeah, I, I think we'll see more housing construction i think the jump in rates scared builders off too and and you know i think that that we're starting to see the effects though of of the tight inventory nationally although we haven't seen much of this in california yet nationally we have seen new home building start to tick up and and kind of respond to the fact that existing inventory is so incredibly low and and builders that already had units that were close to completion are 
doing a bit more negotiating, I think, than those existing homeowners in terms of, you know, doing rate buy downs and offering different kinds of concessions and incentives and putting granite in and, and all kinds of other stuff that they have a little bit more flexibility to do. So actually, the new home share of, of the overall market has been rising pretty good for the last year. Again, not much of that's happening here in in California, but I think, you know, supply and demand ultimately tells and there is certainly demand for for the product. And I think you'll start to see that in California where they can get the projects approved. What should first time buyers be? What what kind of market will they be entering into in 2024? Yeah, it's interesting. I know that it's it's really easy to get kind of bogged down in where interest rates are. And that's like the primary focus of buyers out there. But I, I would advise folks to both be thinking long term and the Fed just put out new 2022 survey of consumer finance data is what it's called, but it basically shows net worth broken down by all these different demographic characteristics. But the one that's that's so compelling is when you break down net worth in America by owners versus renters, and you see how you know renters are essentially no better off today than they were 30, 40 years ago in in real terms, and the homeowners are the ones with all the wealth. So I always kind of scratch my head when homeowners and home potential would be home buyers are sitting on the sidelines trying to perfectly time the market and get that perfect interest rate or that bottom and price. And, and really it's a long-term play. And unlike other investments, you actually still get to live there. So, Hey, I would say, you know, focus on what home ownership is all about in the first place. But B, I would say that even though rates are, are high and that's the one that grabs all the headlines, you actually see other factors shifting in favor of buyers. Now, um, you know, homes are taking a little bit longer to sell. That's actually good for you as a home buyer because it means the sellers are maybe a little bit more uh, motivated, right? A little bit more willing to negotiate. In fact, we're seeing that the percent of sellers that are offering a price reduction has been going up for about three months coinciding with this jump in rates. And so even though the mortgage rate's still above seven, uh, and that's bad. There's all these other things I think that you got going for you as a buyer that you probably wouldn't have had over, you know, in that kind of super low rate environment. Nobody was really reducing prices or doing rate buy downs or or anything like that. And so even though the rate piece is negative, there's a lot of other positives. And certainly that long term price appreciation potential. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, means you're going to make a lot of money long run. And guess what? You can always kind of go out and refi if I'm totally wrong and my forecast sucks and rates do go down to 3% again, you, you can take advantage of that. Nothing prevents you from leveraging that in the future, but you can never go back in time and, um, you know, accumulate equity on a house that you didn't own at the time. And the only way to do that is to start the, the clock ticking and getting your foot on the property ladder. So. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned about the market has some advantages for buyer. I've talked, I was talking to somebody who's looking for a home in San Francisco and I said, Oh, are, are prices, uh, have you found better prices? And he goes, no, but now I'm competing with three other buyers, not 12. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I've actually had a seller be willing to consider a repair rather than just like, no, take it or leave it. I've got 14 offers. Um, so things do seem to be improving a bit there. Um, yeah. One thing we, I, at least I've been reading about in some markets, and I think these are more the urban markets, are a lot of cash buyers coming in. Um, is this foreign? Are these domestic buyers selling expensive properties, downsizing? Um, again, I, this seems to be mostly, I think, in larger markets like San Francisco or parts of L.A. And I know Manhattan, I think, hit 40 percent cash. Um, yeah. What, what, what do you think is behind this or what 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 what's that part of the market? Yeah. So I think, you know, it's all of the above, essentially. On the one hand, we have those high income earners that are still doing well economically. And again, unemployment's still pretty low and incomes are rising in the stock market and all of that stuff. So you have a lot of folks that are out there either buying larger primary residences or second homes. And you see a lot of those folks doing it with cash. One of the interesting things about the current cycle is you know, it's it's characterized by a lot of inflation and and real estate tends to be pretty attractive in inflationary environments as kind of a hedge to inflation, assuming that the property value goes up at least as much as the cost of haircuts and everything else. Um, and so I think you see a lot of people parking money in real estate. We've certainly seen the number of 
investors coming into the market rise as you know some folks get priced out of the market and they're forced to rent the investors are banking long term on that price appreciation the other really interesting aspect of the kind of purchasing power dynamic that we talked about where maybe you know when rates were at three percent you might have qualified for an eight nine hundred thousand dollar home at seven hundred thousand you know, or at 7%, excuse me, you might only qualify for 600,000. So you've lost a bunch of money, but you still have those $900,000 tastes. And over the last 12 months, in particular, we've seen the flippers coming back because you have buyers that maybe still qualify and are still employed and at that higher end of the income spectrum. But again, they're, they're really picky. And so there, it creates that kind of opportunity for flippers to take something that's been lived in for a really long time and get it more camera ready because it seems like that's more where, where the market's at. So I think you have kind of all of, of the above people hedging against inflation, people parking money, you know, in, in real estate to protect, you've got the investors who are, you know, looking at our trend towards becoming potentially majority renter as a state and wanting to gobble up properties and bank on that price appreciation and the cash flow and all of that stuff. So it it's, you know, kind of a function of the higher rates that, you know, while it while it negatively affects those folks out there taking out a mortgage, it kind of clears the path for other folks to to move in who have money to deploy and they're still banking on real estate. You mentioned um the issue of us potentially becoming a majority of interest state. We're mm. pretty close right now, right? Yeah. And actually, if you look at it city by city and the census only goes to, I think, you know, the 150 or so largest cities in California every year. But I think probably, you know, a third of those, maybe 50, 60 are already majority renter. And, and that's problematic, not just for, you know, realtors. Obviously, I think, you know, when you think about California being this kind of economic engine and powerhouse, and we always love to brag about how we're, you know, the sixth largest economy in the world, standalone and all of that kind of stuff. Well, that's kind of contingent on having the best workforce in the world. And it's becoming harder and harder to keep workers here. We have all these amazing universities and we train folks to do these amazing jobs and they take those skills and our subsidized public university educations and go work in Denver and Washington and Austin, Texas um, and all of that stuff. And I think, you know, the we still see it even to this day for all that we read about millennials and they just want to live in a you know apartment by Trader Joe's and all of that stuff. I mean, we still see overwhelmingly that home ownership, I think it's like in excess of 85% of folks want home ownership, even millennials, even younger folks, you know, they want to live even in single family um, homes. And I think it's problematic for our economy if we can't deliver on that. And more and more of our um, large employment centers are unaffordable and you have no option but to rent, then, you know, A, it's a fiscal problem because we're going to be on the hook for these people later on when they haven't, you know, managed to move up the the economic ladder but i mean how do you get employers to locate here and how are they able to successfully recruit and fill positions when it's like no matter how much money i pay you you don't have a high quality of life and that's you know again a, a much broader challenge than just for for real estate when you, you mentioned a lot of the challenges in terms of uh, the availability of homes and i think we, mm. i think we're all familiar with a lot of the issues with supply and, and the difficulties of of building in many of our areas. One issue though, of, in terms of increasing supply would be of course, if if certain long-term residents who might want to move uh, would sell their homes and yeah. move to either smaller community, smaller areas. And, and, and this is something they might want to do. What do you think mm -hmm. inhibits that from happening? Because in a lot of areas you're seeing a fairly, a, a much older population, many of whom, as I said, would I think like to move to smaller areas or closer to their kids, but are sticking around in their homes and 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 sometimes feel trapped in those homes. What would maybe help that move? Yeah, I I think you know on the one hand you've got the interest rate lock in effect, and I think some of those older long term homeowners took advantage of of low rates and are discouraged by that. But I think also, especially in California and and I think increasingly in other states as well, you're seeing a lot of these long term um, homeowners butt up against these thresholds for capital gains that mean you you 
potentially face pretty significant financial penalties for selling that home. And, and you hear kind of all the time, I do a lot of outreach to our members across the state and consumers are always there. And um, in some cases they hate their home, right? It's got like a pool. They are sick of maintaining their kids come once a year and never go in the pool or it's got stairs. They don't want to walk up and down. And, and yet, um, the the potential six figures plus of of capital gains is really keeping people in these homes that they don't even really want. Like you said, we could even do a better job of um, better allocating our housing stock, right? Like you know the the construction issues aside, we also have a totally inefficient allocation of our existing homes because you've got so many of these long-term homeowners in these big giant houses that they raise their kids in and don't want anymore. A family would certainly want that. The older couple might even want a, a condo or something that's more maintained by an HOA or what have you. But because of, of the capital gains, I think when I went through the census data recently and just looked, you know, are these people single or married? When did they buy the house? So what would their capital gains threshold be and and you know i think it's a scary number like 2.7 million households in in california's you know roughly six to seven million you know owner occupied housing units that that are facing capital gains and so those people are just automatically um off the board in terms of of moving and i think you know, the cost of everything has gone up. We inflation adjust like Social Security and all of these things for cost of living. And yet um, we're still, you know, evaluating what makes a, a residential primary residence uh, exemption based on stuff that was now, you know, almost 30 years ago. Um, and 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 I think when you lower that or, you know, I've heard that it's being kicked around that those could double and then we'd start indexing it. To inflation, I think the locked in, you know, folks facing capital gains drops from 2.7 million, which is a huge chunk to just over a million and change. And of course, not everybody is going to move, but that, you know, 1.6 million households that would no longer be subject to a capital gains tax, um, even if a, you know, five, 10 percent of those moved, you're talking about 80, 150,000 units plus. And um, that's, right. that's pretty significant. Yeah, I mean, I think Prop 19, we tried to do that for a property tax to make it easier right. for seniors to move um, so that they wouldn't take a property tax hit. But and there is, as you mentioned, current legislative uh, efforts uh, with a bill sponsored by Leon Panetta on the federal level, which is supported mm -hmm. by CAR and NAR to double and index. So we're hoping that that uh, it does work and, and is going forward. It looks like we do. There is bipartisan support for it. And there's going to be a lot of budget dealing soon. So hopefully uh, that that will do it. Um, on a more morbid note, uh, Jordan, I'm going to just talk about, I, I, I recently went to an economics presentation where the person tried to very delicately allude to the fact that at some point in the near future, we are going to see boomers uh, move on, um, boomers and, and older move on. What kind of effects do you think that might have on the California housing market in the uh, the next, I don't know, 10 years or so, or or if any mar effect on the market? Yeah, I think it'll, you know, you'll see some of that supply start to cycle back into the housing market. I'm not really worried about a flood of supply tearing prices down or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, because I saw some article, I don't know, on Apple News about that, like, oh, soon there's going to be bargains, you know, just wait it out. Yeah, I don't think so. I think, you know, potentially what you could see is that the, the price appreciation and growth won't be as significant as it has been up to this point, where it's just year after year constantly outpacing income growth and affordability just gets worse and worse and worse. I think it could end up being a much needed source of of supply. But, you know, the millennial generation, which is all kind of in their 30s and upwards now, I think are, are a pretty sizable generation. So, you know, uh, in order, you know, in other words, there, there's kind of a, a natural outlet for that. And then the other thing is that even if there is a kind of flood of homes from folks at the upper end, well, A, I think you're going to see a lot of these get left on and become primary residences due to affordability, right? It's like, even if your kid's a computer engineer or something like that, they can't afford to buy a house in mm -hmm. San Francisco right now. And so they'll inherit the family home. And I think you'll see a lot of folks get into home ownership via that mechanism 
moving forward, uh, which will absorb some of those units as well. But then the other thing is we're butting up against like a 30, 40 year backlog of underbuilding. Yeah. And so, you know, there's just, it, it's, you know, at this point, pretty insatiable, the amount of demand that I think it'll have some impact. And again, we'll see some of those units come back into the mix, but some of them will get inherited. Other ones, people will just buy them outright on the market. So I don't think it'll be problematic. I, I think, you know, again, we're, it, it all comes down to the econ 101 stuff of just like how many homes there are and how many people there are. So. So Jordan, in California, we recently started the California Dream for All program, which uh, originated with Senator uh, Pro Tem Tony Atkins, and which CAR has been a strong, strong supporter of. And I think one of the aspects, and I'd like your view on this, is that a lot of people can afford the payments, but the down payment is such a hurdle. Could you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we have a lot of high income earners that just don't, you know, haven't historically had the access to that generational wealth. Their parents, grandparents didn't own a home what have you, you know, you, you got, I think the biggest obstacle pretty consistently in our surveys is saving for a down payment. And so those kinds of programs really help. I think there's also a big education gap and we still see a lot of folks who don't understand how much money you actually need as a down payment. So people think you need hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in many cases you can get in um, for a lot less than, than that. And I think, especially when you think about it through the lens of like the overall home ownership rate and through the lens of right. fair housing and things like that, where there um, isn't that generational wealth to lean on. That's why those programs were so um, popular, but also why they've been so successful too at actually generating, you know, home ownership opportunities. Yeah, I, I agree with you, especially the generational wealth aspect. A lot of people, as you mentioned earlier about our great public universities, get really good educations and get really good jobs. But yeah, the, they don't have the parents who can give them a down payment and that's but they can support those homes. Yeah. Yeah. And with rents so high, it's it's no picnic trying to save up on your own. You mentioned the significant underbuilding. So fundamentally, you know, we we always say supply is the solution. It sounds like you're basically on the same tack of that we just need a lot more housing supply. We do. And we need, you know, kind of all of the above. It's, it's, you know, one of the most compelling slides I always show when I go out and do speeches is one that shows, you know, our population in the early 80s when we were like 25 million people and the population now, which is essentially 40 million, you know, roughly. And and yet, if you look at what we used to build in the 80s, when we were 15 million people small, I mean, we would permit almost 300,000 a year. Um, that wasn't kind of a, an outlier. That was pretty much the norm, two, 300,000 units. Now, if we break 100,000 permits, again, as a 40 million person state, there's 15 million more bodies. We're, we're excited when we see 100,000 permits. And um, you know, the the estimates of how much need there actually is out there vary and depends on how you calculate it. And you can get all into the weeds of the technical nuance of how they come up with these estimates of need. But, you know, ultimately, I think it's it's clear that you can't have 15 million more people and build a third as much as you used to, like no matter what, uh, even if you look at the state's estimates, I think, and I, I would argue that you could easily characterize those as pretty conservative. The HCD says we need 180,000 units a year just to tread water on on housing affordability, not to even improve or tackle the you know um, longstanding shortfall, but just to keep pace right with our need every year. And and again, 100,000 is like a banner year for California. So even in a great year lately we're running roughly half of, of what the need is. And that doesn't even start to pay down the, the accumulated debt that we've built up over all this time. So so the state's been doing, uh, as you're very aware, various actions and lo localities have been doing some things as well to try to incentivize building more supplies. You know, eight, one of the more successful tax has been um, the ease of building ADUs. Uh, you know, reducing permit fees in some areas, incentivizing multi-units in, in various others. What what things do you think would really move the envelope on supply? Yeah, I think, you know, the ADU thing is really the only success story when it comes to supply. I think last year we got up to 130,000 units and almost that entire jump from 100 to 130,000 was almost all ADU. So, but for that, we'd be just plugging along at the same kind of status quo 
So I think there's more tweaks like that that we can make. I think at the state level, we got to look at, um, you know, CEQA, not at the cost of sacrificing the environment or anything like that, but just how easy it is for anybody to come in and challenge a project and make it, you know, economically less viable by dragging it out, raising the cost. I, I think that's certainly um, one of them. I think, you know, enforcing the state's housing laws that we already have on the books. And I know that's one of our big focuses right. and Californians for Home Ownership does that. And I think there's, you know, already good laws out there that aren't, you know, we're not holding folks accountable to in, in the best ways that we could or in all the areas that we could or should. I think a lot of it's got to happen at the local level too. You know, I think whether it's zoning or, you know, permit processes and just how expensive and time consuming and all the various, you know, hurdles and hoops that you have to jump through the uncertainty. I think really it's, it's kind of all of the above. I think, you know, Frankly, we we also need just like to win over hearts and minds, right? Because I think a lot of these public policy issues come down to the the public perception component, right? You've got planning commissions that don't want to approve housing. You've got permit processes and things that are onerous because really the the residents don't want new construction in their neighborhoods. I think the NIMBY challenge is probably just as important and and you know immediate as as some of these actual hard policy changes that we can make because some of these things may solve themselves right if you've got folks that are connecting the dots that this is impacting our kids this is impacting our economy this is impacting home ownership um, then we might be a little bit more willing to allow housing and you might see more pro-housing you know policy makers and pro-housing policies that gain traction with that and I'm again trying to veer into your area I guess a little bit but I think policy makers you're you know in some ways we're asking them to stick their neck out on housing because it's not particularly popular um, to build supply in people's backyards we all agree that supply is critical and then you're like cool we're going to do this um, project down the street from your house and then people are like whoa whoa you know, and I think that that's uh, one of the bigger obstacles as well. And just, you know, aside from all the technical stuff. Yeah, it's something I always tell people when I do outreach is everybody's like, yeah, there should be a lot more housing over there somewhere. Right. <laughs> you know, there need, there need to be housing over there. Um, one thing which I hear and it's 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 almost like in 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 hushed circumstances, which is. I think deep down a, a slight fear that, well, yeah, if you have more supply, it'll be more affordable. Oh, no, it'll be more affordable that I won't see the kind of increases that I've seen on my property. But it seems to me that the supply deficit is so large yeah. that that's not necessarily a very realistic fear that people would have. But what do you say to that? No, I think, you know, the dream scenario is that we get prices that are still going up, but just not going up so much faster than income so that you have this, you know, tiny sliver of the population base that actually gets to take advantage of all of those benefits of home ownership. Right. Better, you know, it's not just the dollars and cents and and things like that. And I think, you know, again, the the estimates of need are all over the map, but, you know, you could, I think, conservatively say a couple of million units. Well, if you look at the need every year just to keep pace with population of, you know, 200,000, um, you know, and and the fact that we only really build about 100,000, it's like we could triple the amount of new home construction that we do and stay at that level for 10 years and still not have fully chipped away right. um, at the accumulated shortfall. And so I think, you know, and, and it's funny, even on a very hyper localized basis, people are always worried about that, like, oh, they're putting in some townhomes or some row homes. You know, my property values are going to go down. If you look at what happens to the prices of existing homes in close proximity, even to new developments, even the ones that are higher density, those property values actually go up, not down. Um, so, you know, I think both on a very, very micro level, you don't see it. And on a macro level, again, you're absolutely dead on that. It's like you got to do a lot of building to overcome a several million unit shortfall to, to really drive prices um, down, not just to grow more slowly, which I think is what ultimately would probably happen if we were building the right amount. So post-pandemic, we have seen, it looks like, although I know in a lot of places, people are uh, no longer having as many hybrid workplaces, but mm -hmm. it seems like you have an overall trend still toward hybrid work uh, remaining. 
Um, you have cities like where I live in Sacramento, where we are seeing some, an influx of people from the Bay Area who don't have to work, you know, yeah. go in every day. Do you think that could be part of a solution, which is to, I don't know if the state should be encouraging it or to otherwise, if this trend continues, where maybe you would be able to get simply, frankly, more housing built in the interior where we are more friendly, frankly, to building and that could help alleviate some of the state's issues. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, the the remote working has come down a bit. I think we went from next to nothing before the pandemic up to like 50, 60 percent, um, which included the whole service sector where they simply can't work remote. So it was actually huge percentages. And I think it's come down to about 25, 30 mm -hmm. percent roughly. And, and I think it'll probably hover in in that, you know, range it's I think it will be a la lasting legacy of the pandemic. And there is that kind of structural shift where a lot of people will go back to the office, but maybe not five days a week, eight hours right. a day. I think you'll see that kind of couple day average. Some will be fully remote. Some will go fully back to the office and hybrid, but it'll end up being about two days a week, probably remote on on average. And I think that that, you know, is a perfect way to kill two birds because you've got, you know, I, I think more pain to come on the commercial real estate side, and you'll start to see um, office owners, small retail and things like that, maybe old motels and things that um, are willing to get out of the game, right? And and those overcome a lot of the traditional objections to new residential development, right? We're not clearing brownfield. These are structures that already exist. They usually always have parking, which is a big sticking point there. They already exist and they're there and there's walls. I think um, the, the government could certainly help. There's a cost differential there to commercial leases versus residential on a per square foot. It's also, they, you know, they weren't designed with you know, multiple individual units in mind. And so putting bathrooms and all those places, the cost of retrofitting, um, I think it's a huge opportunity, but that's where I could see the government being able to play a role is to help offset some of that retrofitting costs and make it worthwhile to um, help some potentially ailing commercial owners. And I think, you know, in some markets like San Francisco and even parts of LA, you're seeing 20, 25, even 30% office vacancy at this point. So I think it's a prime opportunity, but I think, you know, the government could really help to grease the skids with some tax credits or however the, the experts structure that kind of stuff to help overcome some of those, you know, upfront costs of making that happen. You provided a nice segue to a, a two-part question about what are some of the potential clouds on the horizon? And one of those clouds that I sometimes see varying articles, some which are not so alarmist and some which are the sky is going to fall because of it, which is the situation with commercial real estate. Um, so can you speak to both of those, the situation with commercial real estate and also, you know, potential clouds? You've sort of, we, we see our, the overall forecast is, you know, again, built on sort of sound economic principles. But as we've learned from the pandemic, the un uncertain, the uh, unpredictable happens. So, I, I, what, what would you see as possible downside risk? And I'll, I'll, I'm uh, I'm going to follow this up with the more sunny upside, you know, upsides in a, in yeah. a second. But perfect. Yeah. No, I I think there's three real big wild cards that I'm keeping my eye. Again, you said that our forecast is still for a, a modest expansion next year and all of mm -hmm. that stuff. But I think the thing. The things that could upset that forecast are commercial real estate on the one hand, and those vacancy rates have really started to rise. Mostly it's limited to office and to a lesser extent retail, but I think we're you know still in the early days of that commercial stuff. And so both for commercial practitioners, I think it'll be tough because prices have come down. I just did a speech with Lawrence Yoon the other day in San Jose. And he was talking about how office prices are off already by about 20% from peak when rates were super low. And, and, you know, both you have the structural aspect, which we already talked about, where, you know, there's just not as much pound for pound demand for office space in a remote work kind of environment. But the other thing is, you know, there's there's no such thing as a 30 year fixed rate office loan. Right. You have a lot of folks that are going to have to re-up this debt 
on office space and and they're gonna you know even if you want to keep all of your office space you're gonna be paying a lot more for it at 10 percent or wherever you can um you know re-up that debt at and and so there's going to be a huge cost to that but the kind of bigger problem is the contagion aspect and most of the people who own this commercial debt is you know community banks you didn't see the biggest you know the jp morgan chases out there doing a lot of this office lending it was a lot of um, community-based banks and you could see um banks that would potentially be taking it on the chin financially which would lead to more chaos like in financial markets and just you know we already saw what happened with silicon valley bank and you could see more of that kind of stuff happening if if commercial goes bad and then that means you know unemployment and job losses and and kind of those broader macroeconomic impacts so that's kind of the the big wild card i think or the shoe that could potentially drop the other one is just consumers in general um we're pretty much still an entirely consumer driven show economically at this point you know they're 70 percent of gdp but they're like 90 percent of all the growth and um you know in addition to seeing the cmbs delinquencies having doubled we've also seen both the reliance on credit cards to fuel the spending up to this point but also those credit card delinquencies have also doubled alongside the cmbs delinquency and you, you know, if if consumers, even if we don't see a big surge and people go on BK, um, if they stop to catch their breath and don't buy as many TVs or stop going out as much, we don't have a lot to fall back on. We're not building a lot, you know. We don't have um, the government stepping in and spending as much as they have been up to this point. And so, I think that's another source of growth. And then the other big one, I think, is. Um, you know, more close to home, but the the insurance stuff is really hindering the market on top of just the macroeconomic challenges. Rates are high. Nobody wants to sell. Buyers have been priced out, but even the buyers who want to move forward, you know, you're seeing the cost of the insurance, which is where I think ultimately this all lands, right, is we'll get the availability back and people can find insurance, but it's just going to be um, more expensive. And I'm I'm even more worried about it through the lens of you know, HOAs and condos, mm -hmm. which I've been hearing increasingly are going to get hit with this because they have limits on how much they can pass on or raise their HOA premiums and all of that stuff. So I think the market's already got a lot of challenges just due to the economics of things. And now the insurance piece is, is I think, making an already difficult job, you know, harder. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, none of those clouds and, and we are cautiously, very cautiously optimistic that we are going to get some movement on insurance in the coming year in California um, and actually across the country. This is now the insurance issue is a nationwide problem. Yeah. Um, what about on the upside? I mean, we the forecast is that I, in my view, the forecast is actually pretty good. Uh, for yeah. the coming year. But as you mentioned, it's coming off kind of a rougher year in terms of inventory and sales. What would maybe be more, you said wild cards, most of those wild cards were on the like, uh oh, side of things. Yeah. What would be uh, a more sunnier scenario potentially? And this is an uh, upcoming election year, which sometimes might result in certain policies to maybe tweak or make make things brighter. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think we could, you know, see ongoing improvement on the supply stuff, both because I think, you know, we're, we could potentially outperform on rates and I'm not uh, super bullish and think we're going to see 5% rates anytime soon. But I, again, I think the economy is not as strong as those headline numbers. And so when you look at the Fed funds rate and their projections, I, you know, I think they probably are a little bit too pessimistic and maybe willing to back down on that. And that will help with the supply stuff. It will help with affordability. I think, you know, the ADU laws will continue to work and they seem pretty popular, right? Like if you can get a HELOC board or find a way to finance it, people seem to be amenable to that. And so hopefully the supply, you know, the new construction numbers will continue to trend in, in the right direction. And just that that whole financing mechanism, getting comps for um, renting out ADUs and all of that, that will just only mature. And I think make that market a lot more feasible and, and realistic going forward, that capital gains thing. And I, you know, again, I don't uh, kind of 
you know, make odds when it comes to what happens in Congress, but that would have a huge impact. You know, that's a lot of folks that are locked away that could potentially come onto the market. And again, supply is the limiting factor. I think all of that stuff could really help to get us back to maybe not 500,000, but at least 400,000 units, which is kind of where we were before the the pandemic and and really help the other thing is and i know i've been really pessimistic probably when it comes to new construction and supply but um you know talking about nimbyism and all of that i think at least the good news is it does seem like there is now at least consensus that supply is a major issue nobody wants it in their neighborhoods still but we used to not even agree that supply was the issue and i think that in and of itself is progress right and we're talking about the how and not the the weather or the if, you know, it's a housing mm-hmm. supply issue. And so even there, I think it's easy to be really pessimistic and not see a lot of progress. But I think there's at least, you know, growing consensus that we've got to get this figured out. And, you know, our kids are all complaining about paying expensive rents and all that. So I think maybe there's there's hope for the future that we get our act together and and all of that. So. Yeah, we're. I think. I think a lot of people on the political front, we are cautiously optimistic about that uh, capital gains bill, in part because you're now, ironically, because Californians are moving, <laughs> moving across the country, we're seeing a lot of states. I guess you can say the redder states, ironically, which have not seen the kind of appreciation historically that places like New York or California have seen. You know, places like Texas, Tennessee, Georgia are now seeing the kind of appreciation where that actually is now affecting them. Yeah. So. Well, that's one of the upshots of us having been so unaffordable for so long is that we, you know, created all these housing refugees that went out and pumped up prices <laughs> and all these other uh states. The other thing which I think is probably less likely but never say never, but you have a lot of lenders out there that aren't Fannie Freddie back that could potentially, you know, introduce new loan products that would help to overcome some of this lock-in effect, like maybe let homeowners, you know, like credit unions or portfolio lending, and they can make whatever rules they want. If they want to let you take your mortgage with you when you move, if they want to let you assume loans that they've already originated. I mean, those are all that's true. kind of off the wall solutions, but you know, those things could have a big impact and there's nothing really stopping those folks. And I think you'll, they'll get sick of servicing super low rate loans and want to write some seconds and you never know. Jordan, it's been a great talk with you today. Are there any final comments, any final remarks that you'd like to give us? No, I would just say, you know, again, housing is all about the long-term benefits. I always, you know, kind of emphasize the wealth accumulation. And, you know, I joke that I'm the son of a guy who didn't even graduate high school and I'm here today because he owned his own home. And I think that's the stuff that falls by the wayside, but it's not just the dollars and cents, you know, and people are freaked out, like, why would I buy right now? Or what's the market going to do in the next 12 months? But it's really, again, a long-term play. And um, there's really no downsides to it. Your kids do better in school, you know, better graduation rates, better test scores. Um, your, Your kind of pocketbook looks better your health outcomes are better and so i think you know it's it's important that we as as a real estate community remind folks of that i think it's you know one of the nice things about working at car is that it's good for you as an individual it's good for the realtors who are out there as entrepreneurs it's good for our economy because when we deliver on the american dream then you get you know the the powerhouse economic growth that california has enjoyed for all this time so there's really um no downsides and i think we just got to get folks back focused on the the prize and making sure that we're facilitating that as an opportunity um for the future generation so all right Thank you very much, Jordan. It's been a great talk with you. Appreciate it. Disclaimer. The purpose of this podcast, brought to you by the California Association of Realtors, CAR, is to provide general and educational information and opinions from a wide range of perspectives regarding politics, voting, elections, legislative issues, and more. The opinions, beliefs, and views expressed by guests or participants of this podcast are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, or views of CAR, its affiliates, their respective directors, officers, or employees. Reference to any individual or entity does not constitute an endorsement, recommendation, or any other position or opinion regarding that entity or individual by CAR. 
This podcast does not constitute professional advice or services of any kind. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast.